he has appeared as male or female or neither, as child or elder, peasant or king, magician or fool. He has been an entire cartomantic arcana, for the master of mankind is also a master of disguise. He has performed all of these roles well with delicacy. He has been humble when humility was needed, gentle when softness was the best device, sly, amiable, reassuring, commanding, caring. He has been terrible when terror was the only recourse, and sometimes meek in order to inherit the earth. This is a quote from End in the Death, Volume 1. It's a novel I've been drawing from quite a bit from the Season 1. If you've been following me through our Season 1 journey on the Grimdark History Podcast, you know we've been exploring all the historical times and people the Warhammer 40,000 character The Emperor of Mankind has been in this popular fiction. When I started this podcast more than a year ago, I had already selected the topic for Season 1 and was determined to perform this chronologically with each series of episodes exploring a particular time period and the person we knew the Emperor of Mankind was at that time. The topic, the time periods, and historical people were selected in April of 2023. Six months later, in October that same year, Hamas led an attack on the civilians of Israel, and I questioned whether or not to proceed with the planned topic for this series that's about to start. Certain topics in history, they have a sensitivity to them, and they can be hot to the touch. Nuance can be thrown out the window, and it can be reductive very quickly. You're only on my side or the wrong side. This latest conflict has only increased the temperature on really any topic that relates to Jerusalem. And this, and I think rightly so, had me pause to consider the best approach to this topic and whether I even should. Ultimately, I decided to push forward with the strong intention that I would stick to my topic, treat it with the respect it deserves, avoid sensationalizing horrors, and to make sure my listeners have an opportunity to learn about a fascinating period of time. A time period where people struggling with their identities rise up to take a stand and define their identities to avoid being swallowed up. If you were a keen listener to my opening quote from the novel The End and the Death, Volume 1, by author Dan Abnett, you might already have put two and two together and figured out what part of my opening quote applies to the history of Jerusalem. And if you haven't, I'm going to pull that out for you now. Quoting or drawing again from my opening quote, he has been dot 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 meek in order to inherit the earth. Now, even though author Dan Abnett doesn't come out and explicitly say who this meek person is who will inherit the earth, I think my audience will have already guessed that this historical figure is Jesus of Nazareth. Having many months to consider the best way to approach this topic, I decided to avoid the kind of biblical life of Jesus. If you'd like to learn about that, the Bible is, of course, a great resource. And I've said many times on this podcast, one of our goals is to get at what was life really like for the people in these times. And so I started looking for anything that could adequately describe and provide context in order to understand that question. I approach this from a literary and historical point of view, and while there is a lot of literary documents on Roman life at this time, and of course there is the Bible, there's not a lot of independent history of actual accounts from actual people who lived in the land of Judea at this time that aren't tied explicitly to the Bible. 
However, my research did lead me, pardon me, did lead me to historian Yosef ben Metatayu, and apologies if my Hebrew's off there. Yosef is better known as Flavius Josephus. He was born in 37 Common Era, This would have put him roughly within a few years, one way or the other, of the death of Jesus. He was a Jewish priest who lived in Judea. He traveled to Rome. He lobbied Roman emperors for the life and freedom of several of his people. He later led armies in open rebellion against Rome. He was captured and enslaved by a future Roman emperor, Vespasian who later gave Josephus his freedom and his Roman name that we know him by. Josephus stayed at the court of Vespasian and his son, the emperor Titus. And while he was there, he wrote two major histories of the Jewish people. One is called The Antiquity of the Jews, and the other is called The Wars of the Jews. Josephus accompanied Titus on his war of pacification and the destruction of the Judean countryside. And it's Josephus' writing that describe the life and people that lived within a generation of the time of Jesus. And these are the only descriptions of the Roman destruction of Jerusalem that are actual first-hand accounts of the desperate at times, miraculous, brave, and what is undoubtedly horrific events of the populace of Jerusalem during its destruction by Rome. It's these two literary and historical sources, the antiquity of the Jews and the wars of the Jews, that are my primary sources that I will be drawing these major events from. Now, I do have a lot of secondary sources, I did um, spend a lot of time studying uh, Dr. Uh, Henry Abramson's uh, YouTube channel. He has a lot of YouTube lectures online on the history of Jewish people. He spent quite a few um, lectures talking about this time period, and I spent a lot of time studying those while I was reading The Antiquity of the Jews and The Wars of the Jews. On top of that, I was trying to understand Roman perspectives, so I read uh, a couple different books about Roman history, the early Roman emperors that covered this time period, to see if I could get any accounts in there of that kind of Roman perspective of the horrendous things that happened there. Before I could adequately understand that time, I was trying to get at the context of the events that led to the moment, trying to understand the triggers of the Jewish revolt, trying to understand the society pressures that led to the rise of Jesus of Nazareth and his movement, trying to understand how Roman pressures increased the temperature and kind of boiled things over. And as I was trying to understand these things, I kept going, having to go backwards, further in time. And I found myself drawn ever more backwards, rewinding history in this land in search of the proverbial first domino that would help me understand the events that would lead to the rise of the Jesus movement, the Jewish revolt, and the eventual destruction of Jerusalem. And I found myself drawn all the way back, roughly 200 years before the time of Jesus, to what is commonly known as the Maccabee Revolt, where people under intense and dynamic pressures found themselves losing some of the key things that they could consider uniquely Jewish about their identities, being swallowed up by the Greek culture of the empire whose thumb they were under, and an irrepressible desire to protect and define their Jewish identity in a world being swallowed up by another culture. And yet, even as the Maccabee family raises the countryside into popular revolt against their overlords, 
the politics, the intrigue, assassinations that internally convulse this nation still being formed, still struggling to define itself, reveals power struggles in a not-yet-united Judea, not even a yet-united Maccabee family. It's a time where allies and enemies are blurred. At times, they're interchangeable, with all the political players and power struggles to rival the Game of Thrones. And yet, even as I began to unravel this knot and try to come to some understanding, I found myself still struggling to grasp at the heart of this conflict, the thing that first domino that leads all the way forward 200 years. And to help me get to the root of this struggle, I had to reach out to an expert. And as I said many times, I am not a historian. What I am is a fan of history, sharing my love and appreciation of history with you. But for this topic, I needed an expert. And so for episode one of our series, Exploring the Historical Times of Jesus, I'm happy to say I do have an actual expert. I have a historian, author, associate professor of ancient history, Dr. Boris Krubasik from the University of Toronto. His specialization is on this specific time period, the Maccabee Revolt, early Roman control of Judea, and this region. He's joining me for the first of the month, and Dr. Krubasik and I will discuss the complex nuances of the time period of the Maccabee Revolt, try and get at that first domino that will help give us all that all-important context moving forward into the next episodes in this series. And if you enjoy the format, if you enjoy me having expert guests on the show to talk about a specific topic, feel free to let me know. Reach out. I'm available by email, at, by emailing grimdarkhistory at gmail.com. I'm also on YouTube at grimdarkhistory. And I'm also on Instagram at grimdarkpod. So reach out to me. Let me know what you feel like the this new format. If it's successful, I'd like to have more guest experts on. But without further ado, I give you my interview with Associate Professor Dr. Boris Krubasik. Hello, everybody. My name is Jeremy Agnew. I'm the host of the Grim Dark History podcast, where we explore the intersection between history and popular fiction. Today, I'm happy to say I'm joined by a special guest. We have uh, Boris Krubasik, an associate professor of ancient history from the University of Toronto. He's also currently the chair of the Department of Historical Studies who has research centers on the Eastern Mediterranean world from the time of Persians to early Roman period, and particularly focuses on questions of empire, power, and cultural interaction. Thank you very much, Boris, for taking your time out of your busy schedule to join me today. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me. Thank you. I'm really pleased to be here. Great. So maybe uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, what, your career, areas of expertise, uh, any maybe interesting pieces of research you, you're working on you'd like to talk, talk to us about? Um, yeah, sure. I can do that. Thank you. I, I think for most of my career so far, I've been really thinking about, and you kind of hinted at that in your introduction, I've been thinking about questions of empire and and how does it how does it work, right? I mean, if you we read about ancient empires but the questions to me and this is how my research started is like how do these empires actually structurally work how do kings communicate that what they want gets done and how how are they perceived within the empire right and that was really how my how i started my doctoral research and where i initially came from and since then in the last 10 years i'm also more and more 
asking the questions of what it means to live life in imperial spaces. Again, the kings are present, but also very far away. And I'm trying to to get a handle on yeah on on what does life in imperial spaces especially also if these empires change what is life like in these spaces and i've written a book on uh, on cultural adaptations and on on cultural questions i'm also like wrote a couple of articles on questions of like what does it mean to to experience these changes and and that's still what's driving my research at the moment that's uh fascinating one of the the goals I, I have in the podcast and what's oftentimes hard to get at is what was life like in these times. And so understanding how empires work and, and what's like living, you know, there's the, the lowly farmer in the field or the, the potter or whoever that is. And then, like you said, there's the kings and the governors and the people in charge and oftentimes uh, quite distant and um, never the two shall meet. So it's it's interesting to hear that you're working on these things. So in our time that we're we're talking about here, maybe can you can you paint us a picture of what Jerusalem, Judea, what that area is like? You know, right around 160 BCE. You know, who are the major political players in this this region? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, 160 is a is almost like a pivotal date in this time period in this world. So, and there's a lot of different players at play. In Judea exists of the city of Jerusalem and the hill land and the lowlands, uh, and it's bordered by regions like uh, Samaria in the north and Edomia in the south. And they are part of imperial worlds, right? So at this time period, it's part of the world of the Seleucid Empire. And I know we'll talk about that a little bit in, in, in later. But around 160, groups, clearly there are different directions of expressions in Judea about how one should interact with one's neighbors, but also with these imperial powers that are coming by and collecting taxes. And in the 170s, there is the group in charge is, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, is really indicating that they want to adopt certain practices. Uh, and there's a very famous episode where people in Jerusalem seem to adopt, at least that's what we're told in the ancient sources. We have no physical evidence of this seem to adopt um, the idea that there should be a gymnasium. A gymnasium is a, is a Greek cultural institution where young male uh, members of the community exercise and get schooled and get trained. Uh, uh, and there are other parts of the Judean community that react really strongly to it, negatively. Uh, some very positively and, and others really negatively. So in around 160 is the time when, after this has all boiled up in the 70s, when apparently now, uh, a different group is, seems to be in charge of one part of the political voice of Judea, and that is the group of the Maccabees. And that group seems to uh, want to focus on what real Judean values. We have to talk about that, what that means. And so there's a lot of change that's been going on in the last six years, and a, and a war has been fought with the imperial overlords uh, uh, in that area. We also have to think and differentiate between the city and the countryside. Um, we have evidence that in Jerusalem, like in this time period, like people are presumably, uh, um, and we have lots of different people, but we don't have that good evidence. But in the countryside, for example, we have a lot of farmsteads where we can actually see um, where there's a lot of importation of goods from the wider Mediterranean world. Uh, uh, we have a lot of importation of, let's say, Greek silver work from the northern Greek world. And what we can't quite tell always at 100% is, are these Judean people inheriting this material or uh, and adapting it and adopting it? Or are these actually Greek settlers that have been put there by the imperial project? And uh, and they are living there their life uh, and they're importing the things that they used to have. Like in a colonial world that that we're used to from a Western lens, like that you have uh, uh, groups that settle in other lands and then try to incorporate things that they know from the homeland. And so, but we do certainly in the material culture see that there is very different material culture going on. And there seems to be a period of 
where a lot of these things get questioned and and it doesn't seem entirely peaceful so there's it sounds like you know not entirely clear from what evidence we have but there's seems to be possibilities or, or evidence that there's some combination of cultural influence of the greek world from the the seleucids on jerusalem and potentially we have some smaller greek settlers moving into the the countryside and that there is out of this some cultural tension and clashes coming coming to the forefront is, is this what we're getting at yeah absolutely and i mean i think it's very important that that we only know about some of these cultural clashes. We only know about them through basically two sources. And this is the first and the second book of Maccabees. They're literary sources. And uh, and they were rewritten later by a historian named Flavius Josephus, right? And and, and you and I talked about him in, in the, uh, before this podcast. Um, and these sources are written by or in the context of the Hasmonean court, and they're certainly serving the Maccabees and the Maccabean political project, whatever that is, right? And so we have to take that into account. But within that context, within that those documents, it appears clear that there's a group of Judeans, and they're described very negatively, who really seem to think that, and they're not only externals, they're clearly internals and Judeans, uh, who seem to think that, you know, adopting some of these Greek cultural practices is is the way forward for our community. Uh, and then there are others who disagree. And, and I think you, you made an interesting point in some of our early discussions before we, we got on the podcast here, that the Maccabees, like the book of the Maccabees, um, and this is literally history written by the victors, which I, I thought was an interesting point that just never really crossed my mind because this is the ruling class after um, the conflict takes place. They are the ones who literally write the book of the Maccabees, which is in the Bible and, and uh, by that historian Flavius Josephus that you and I were talking about earlier. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, so the 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 it's it's a bit tricky, and not every scholar agrees. But I, it seems to be clear that the Book of Maccabees were both written. One of them was translated into Greek. The second one was written in Greek for the first, like from its outset. And they are emerging as part of what we would we could probably describe as court host historiography. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, at the court of the Maccabees, somebody who we don't know. Uh, uh, writes these these court historiography in a time period when people still remember. This is not in the distant past, right? Uh, but writes the perspective really to to eulogize the new leaders and to to writen the story in in those individuals' perspective. And, and this, uh, you know, just talking about this now is kind of ringing bells in my head um, for for people who've been following the podcast I, we've been going through the history of Alexander the Great and of course literally everything that's written about him comes from I think it's Aristobulus who was basically Alexander's personal court um, press corps uh, is, is this kind of and that's Greek as well is, is there am I making a, a link that doesn't exist here is there is this like a Greek tradition or is this something completely different um i think it's a combination of both i think that that you bring up alexander is is a very interesting point i mean by the time the around 100 right that's that's roughly plus minus 20 well more plus 20 10 20 years uh, around 100 bce is when first one and two maccabees are written possibly a little earlier um by that point the maccabean or hasmonean is the same thing court um, I think it's very clear that there's that it is a Hellenistic court. There's a lot of it that is very Judean about it, but there's also a lot of things that the type of kingship they exercise is is inspired by what they've experienced in the previous 150 years. And Alexander's court and Greek historiography at that court is is part of that world. So on that world, I would say there's definitely Greek influences. The genre in which this is expressed, I mean, on the one hand, two Maccabees clearly written in Greek, so absolutely. But the genre in which it is expressed, the tropes of language that are used, 
uh, and also the references to topography, like uh, Israel is mentioned. Uh, 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 the the relationship of the land is is really one that's steeped in the Hebrew Bible, and and so it's also deeply influenced by by Judean writings of the time period. Okay, and that I think leads well into the the next question here. You know, talking about the Seleucids and Alexander the Great. You know, maybe broadly speaking, or, or in some broad strokes, what has been the last few generations like? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I mean, um, the region of Judea, Samaria, has been part of empires for the last 500, 600 years, right? Uh, and, and even in the second millennium, where conquest with Egypt. And, and so the world of empires in itself is nothing new. But uh, while the Judeans returned to Judea uh, under the Persians in the fourth century, it is really with the campaigns of Alexander that their world is slowly changing. There's very little evidence that Alexander and his immediate successors cared much about Judea. They cared much more about the Phoenician cities. Uh, about Samaria and about the cities on the coast. Um, but it is in the time period, let's say from 200 BC onwards, that, that I mean, the land is contested from roughly 280 onwards, but, but that from 200 onwards that the land gets actively contested between the Seleucids in the north and the Ptolemies who control Egypt in large part of, of some parts of Asia Minor and the Greek islands in the south. Uh, and they're contesting this region. The book of Daniel, uh, another apocryphal book of, of, of the Bible, uh, uh, narrates this miraculous story of the uh, power from the north and the power from the south. And it's probably a, a reflection on these pressures. The land, Judea was part, uh, Syria was always Seleucid, uh, but uh, uh, what modern day, large parts of modern day Lebanon, Palestine, and Israel were Ptolemaic until uh, roughly 199. And uh, were then taken over by Seleucid control. For much of the second century, the Ptolemies are trying, sometimes more, sometimes less, but they're trying to get a hold of this. So in broad strokes, the period has experienced significant change from one imperial overlord to another. That doesn't really have to impact everyday people's lives. This would just be who's ultimately who who the tax man is. That that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And it's it's difficult to say in what degree in that time period this really has an impact. Um, let's say up to one sixty, right? Um, but we do have some evidence that in the one one nine one one nineties we we have an inscription, for example, that mentions these roaming soldiers in the countryside and and when soldiers roam the countryside it's never a good thing yeah, right and yeah. things get stolen uh, and we know from other parts in the in the in the eastern mediterranean world that we also have these i will now tell my soldiers no longer to barrack themselves into people's houses and to no longer steal chickens or uh, or livestock and so so it is difficult to say but at the same time i mean these imperial armies they're 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 not like modern warfare, right? These imperial arm uh, uh, warfare takes place on a on a on a side outside communities, but at the same time, these roaming soldiers who clearly were around there after battles for 10, 15 years, uh, they might have deep impacts on local communities for which we can trace nothing in the evidence. So this this region is kind of pulsing back and forth between. Seleucids, Greek influenced uh, Mesopotamia and, and Persia, and then the Ptolemies, also Greek influenced, but but e Egyptian dynasties, and, and and before that you mentioned Persian control, and and even before that this region was also just kind of pulsing back and forth between Assyrians and Egyptians as well. It's, it seems like it's a place where just by being the bad luck of where they are. They're in the middle of where a lot of different powerful people want to get to each other. And so it just seems to be that's the place that, that just kind of has the bad luck of being in the wrong place geographically where everybody else wants to get get through. Is, is that a accurate representation? 
I think ab absolutely. I think that's that's absolutely fair. I think one one should also add that that the question is also why do these imperial powers care, right? And yeah. and why is this a region that is actually contested at all? And 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 um, in the second century, you know, we we need to add that northern Syria is very agriculturally lush. Uh, southern Palestine is also very lush. We have growing evidence of trade networks in the region so so economically uh not necessarily in the third century but definitely in the second century and going into the first century the region is also doing economically really really well um, okay so and, it's becoming a, an attractive piggy bank to have that's right and already in the third century for example we have these tax accounts of a of a ptolemaic noble and he talks about how he travels around the southern levant and he moves from Maresha to other communities uh, and he picks up this here and this there and clearly talking about this deeply integrated economic network of exchange and while this is part of an imperial world where the imperial agents are clearly extracting resources they are also local beneficiaries to this um, so they are individuals, and they may be noble families. They may be may be traders who who are clearly also benefiting from all of this. And um, you know, trying to dig in a bit more to the people in the area, I was fascinated earlier. You mentioned the likelihood of Greek communities kind of springing up in the region. Is you know, when I think of Judea and Jerusalem in this time frame, and probably what most of my listeners would think about is that it is it is a place that is exclusively kind of culturally Jewish or or that type or ethnically. If there's there's I mean if there's even really a way to say that it didn't really exist at the time as I understand it. But do we have an idea? You know, is this a multicultural, multi ethnic place, or is this? seem to be mostly exclusive um, Jewish people? This is a question that can be answered very quickly and 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 then not at all. So on the one hand, it is definitely, uh, uh, it's both. And, and that, so that's the quick answer. And the other one is the more complicated. Um, so the topography of the Judean hilllands is that the, 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 the landscape we're talking about is very small in terms of kilometer wise, right? Yeah. Um, you, you have this sanctuary in this city called uh, Jerusalem, uh, which when we think about it, looks very different than the Ju uh, Jerusalem we think about nowadays, because even the old city wall, uh, uh, the medieval old city wall is not how the ancient second century BCE city would have looked like. So the city would have looked, the layout would have looked very, very different. But just, you know, uh, a few kilometers, I mean, not a few, but, but within a good hour's modern day drive, you're in Samaria, where there is another big temple. Uh, it's a Judean community that has sacrifices that uh, also believes in the, well, the question is whether it's the same God or it's a different God, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in a type of the same God. Um, and then you have a community just about an hour modern day's drive to the south. Uh, uh, in Idumea, uh, ancient biblical Edom, uh, where Edomians live, and their divinity cause has has very many similarities with uh, uh, the Jewish God, but there's also clearly some differences. It has a different name, for example. Within this, we also have some communities that appear to be more multicultural than others. Uh, so Samaria, there seem to be a lot of farmsteads that demonstrate evidence of Greek cultural influence. Are those Greek colonists? Some of them probably are. Are these wealthy Samarian farmers that adopt the trappings of the imperial family or they buy this sorts of thing uh, because they find it attractive? Is is almost impossible to tell, but we shouldn't exclude one or the other, right? Also in Idumea, um, Idumea is a melting pot of different cultures in the third century and early second century and uh, it's a very fertile valley going towards the towards the southern tip of the dead sea uh, and the city of Maresha, destroyed in the late second century was a melting pot you have phoenicians living there edomians living there judeans living there greeks living there and they all leave their inscriptions oh wow jerusalem itself uh we have far less evidence for that we can see that uh, it's a largely a Judean city and a lot of the 
inner city seems to be located on uh, centered around the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. um, but we also see we have Greek official buildings, which might be some some Ptolemaic administrator. So there are clearly some some Ptolemaic things there. And we also have clearly some cultural uh, uh, adaptations. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, when we talk about this story in one and two Maccabees about the gymnasium, we have a group of Judeans in Jerusalem at the seat of the temple council, the Sanhedrin, who want to turn Jerusalem into a polis. That's the accusation the Maccabees do get do against them. But it is quite likely that that really that the idea of these individual there's a high priest named Jason. His name is presumably Joshua, but he gives himself the name Jason, adapting Greek cultural names. So there is a group that is very keen on cultural exchange. Fascinating. We're painting a very exciting and interesting picture of, of the, the world and everything. Do we have a sense of more of the, the jobs and roles of individual people in this world? Like, what are if it, and if we have any of that information because i know oftentimes it's just not in the record but i'm always curious about you know what are the roles of women or children men slavery you know what's the everyday person in this world what's their life like absolutely um as you as you probably know i mean it's it's very difficult to get into the history of everyday life because everything we have is ultimately an elite story, right? Yeah. And so we can extrapolate from that. In Egypt, where the climactic conditions of the desert have allowed us to have papyri surviving, you get more of um, Even there, it's not really everyday story because the poorest still don't even have the resources to write on papyri or on potsherds or something like that. Yeah. Um, Again, in I don't want to distract us, but 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 again, in Maresha in Idumea, uh, uh, we have some some a lot of potsherd evidence um, that tells us about contracts of sales of donkeys and that sort of thing. Uh, in Jerusalem themselves, our, one of our best pieces of evidence is funerary evidence, and these are mm -hmm. the ossuaries where bones of people are placed in, and and it paints us a picture of in funerary architect a funerary in the language of funerary uh, display uh, uh, of relatively traditional Near Eastern family values, uh, a male dominated society where women are part of male households and presumably the lower the economic spectrum work is being performed on both sides, but where really the economic undertakings are done on the male side, unless it's, we're talking about the poorest of the poor where, where both sides need to work. Yeah. Um, we also know that on a cultic level that that uh, women were only allowed at certain and certain parts of the Jewish temple, um, also only at Jewish purity laws, which are unclear for us at this time period, uh, bar, ban women, uh, uh, especially during menstruation from certain parts of, of religious services. So it is a it is a very male dominated society. Um, it is also a society in which women, like in all other parts of the Eastern Mediterranean world at this time period, were where um, female agency is very limited, mm -hmm. um, where also once young women or young women or even girls get married into other families, they become part of this other household. In funerary culture, which often is a bit more conservative than maybe the environment was, praises for women are that of she was a wonderful mother. She is the mother of that. Is this also how I how you identify individuals? You don't identify them by themselves. You identify them through their family. Um, that is for both for men and for women. But uh, so the family is an important social hub. But it is an entirely male dominated uh, environment. Okay, it's still very fascinating. You mentioned you know the lack of of material evidence, and I knew you talked about how. Um, you know, the desert conditions in Egypt are great for preserving certain things. And it just reminded me, I, I'd done a uh, previous podcast series on uh, Mesopotamia. And I had found a paper somebody had written where they had just had uh, dozens of translations of uh, tablets that had survived uh, the burning because uh, it was all clay tablets. And so they'd hardened, but it was pages and pages of everyday you know people talking about trading or or you know not having good clothes at school and things like that and, and it just kind of popped back in my head about how 
oftentimes our own life kind of the problems we have today translate back to then as well. I was just kind of curious if anything like that had popped up in, in any of your research you had ever done. Oh, absolutely. I mean, so for example, when we think about Judea and, and, and the region, um, there is, of course, the com community at Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, right? And, and that is probably a community that is not representative for the majority of Judeans at the time. It's a specific, presumably religious group that puts itself into very specific positions at this place. But they, uh, we have written scrolls and scrolls. It's a specific branch of scholarship that, that, that uh, they would have discovered since the 40s and have been published ever since. Um, of telling us about this community, about their rules, about their uh, uh, their life in the desert, and what's good, what's bad. They speak of, and this is one of the most interesting things for me, even though it's not the most interesting thing at the site, is they speak of the, the teacher of righteousness who had led them there. So they're clearly a Judean splitter group that at some point, splinter group, that at some point decided that, no, what they're doing in Jerusalem is not for us. And so we're going to live here instead. And we're going to be our own community. And so that is, is one fascinating example. Scholarship has long tried to identify, you know, one of the Maccabean leaders with these, who is this, with this, you know, that was the reason why this teacher of righteousness and his group went, a went away. They speak of a wicked high priest in Jerusalem. Uh, but ultimately, we just can't tell. But we can tell that there's a group that felt that their way of life is not going to continue in the best way possible in Jerusalem. So they decided to move towards the Dead Sea and found a new community there. Um, similarly, in a much earlier period, we have these fascinating documents when um, in the context of Alexander's conquest of uh, the Levantine coast, some probably wealthy Sumerian families fled with their most dearest possessions and hid in a cave between Samaria and, and, and uh, Jerusalem. And possibly because of carbon monoxide poisoning, died in that cave. And, <laughs> and their possessions, their precious documents, land holding deeds, letters, yeah. Uh, survived. And and you can still read them today. They were found, published in 1997 um, in the Wadi Dalier. And it gives you a glimpse of an elite family Yeah, that clearly the changing world that was coming was not for them. So they left um, and they met unfortunate circumstances and therefore uh, their uh, personal documents survived in that cave. Wow. So, so yeah. So for like carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide so they presumably they they started a fire in the cave to keep warm or something and there just wasn't any ventilation and presumably that something like that presumably i don't yeah. think we can fully assess how it worked right yeah. but but I, and if we can i i actually have to admit i don't fully remember how 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 uh how this was determined but but yeah the idea was that this was meant to be a temporary shelter yeah. Uh, and for one reason or another, it ended up being the last uh, 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 refuge for these people. Oh, fascinating. Um, maybe get, getting back to Jerusalem, um, you know, who, who's in charge? You know, as I've been reading my own history and, and trying to brush up on this, it just seems to flip back and forth between kings being in charge and high priests being in charge. Is, is there a difference? Does it mean anything? Who You know, how, how does this role work? It's a very interesting question. It's a question that we actually not a hundred percent have a hundred percent clarity on. Um, the idea is that in biblical times, uh, the high priest was also the king. However, in historic times, it was always clear, and this is part of the Near East more broadly, that the high priest is the leader of Jerusalem, is the leader of the council, highest council of Jerusalem. He's the highest religious authority in the city but that there is also a king somewhere else. Okay. And that is really here is a pivotal moment because with the Maccabees, especially at the very late second and early first century, it's for the first time in hundreds and hundreds of years that they make themselves king and high priest as well. So, there's a high priest in Jerusalem. And, and even the Maccabees, it seems to be that they still 
seem it necessary, even though they're constantly trying to 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 win off independence from the Seleucid, from the Seleucid kings, they they still seem it necessary for their own self representation, presumably within the city, that the Seleucid kings make them high priest. So in one fifty three, allegedly. Jonathan and the first book of Maccabees presents this very proudly that 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 Seleucid usurper, his name is Alexander Ballas, um, and appoints him high priest. And to me, there's no reason why one Maccabees needs to talk about the Seleucids at all, unless that has a meaning, right? Unless that appointment to the high priesthood by somebody who's not of the family of who should be high priest must have a meaning in Jerusalem itself, right? And must carry weight, political weight. So yeah, the, 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 from that moment onwards, we talked about the period about 160. Um, at this time period, there is still a high priest. Before the Maccabees re reach the high priest, so they're clearly the largest power holder in the city, but there also is uh, a high priest called Alchemos who apparently dies around 160. And we don't really know what happens for the seven years in between. Some scholars say that you must have had a high priest. Somebody else must have been high priest. It must have been one of the Maccabees. Uh, but we just don't have any evidence for it. And they also argue that for Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, you need the high priest. But, you know, it's, it's, this, it's all not entirely clear to me uh, whether indeed this is the case. What seems to be striking is that one, from 153 onwards, the, uh, uh, especially under the leadership of Jonathan the Maccabee, that Judean group around the Maccabees and those that support it place a lot of emphasis on their relationship being appointed by the king and they are the ones who in charge in a way that kind of even though the Maccabean revolt uh, starts much earlier that is the moment in which the Maccabees really seize full control of the city of Jerusalem and so this so there there's a sense that even even as people uh, you know, potentially dislike the Seleucids or they're in the middle of this um, kind of revolt against them, they're still seeking somehow um, Seleucid blessing for who is going to be the high... They still have some power, um, or at least, as you said, so, something that carries political weight for them to say this is the person we say should be high priest is is am i understanding that correctly yeah that's 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 the bizarreness of the situation exactly so so in 175 for example the the seleucid king exchanges a high priest uh, and they're still from the same high priestly family it's the brother of the former high priest and 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 that's fine it's the family of the high priest and then then that person gets exchanged again um, but that really that the Maccabees are also once they they once they seize control over large parts of Jerusalem and really are subduing the other groups that seem to exist but for whom we have little evidence, um, they still must be there, right? Um, once the Maccabees are seizing this, they then also play up their relationship with the central uh, central central power. Yeah, absolutely. So, so it seems like high priest is or at least the way the Seleucids treat it high priest is it's not a hereditary office necessarily it's an office that is awarded like a governorship is is that the way other jewish people would see that role or is that a bone of contention with some of them uh, it certainly is a bone of contention. So, so the high priesthood is is linked to a specific family. Now, the family is very, very large, but in theory, it's the family of Aaron the priest and later Zadok. And largely, the Seleucid Empire doesn't really interfere in local, uh, in local administration, and and doesn't challenge that. We also have many hereditary priesthoods in other parts of the Seleucid Empire. And we don't really see the Seleucids taking any even interest in in changing this. So that's so. Therefore, Judea is also interesting because it appears to be it appears to be slightly different. Um, however, in the one seventies, there's a Seleucid king Antiochus the fourth, and he initially exchanges the high priest from the same family, and then exchanges the high priest again, and that individual is not from the priestly family. 
And so and, that and is this hmm? Bacchides? Is am I pronouncing that name right? This the person nobody likes. It's initially Menelaus, but but okay. yes, absolutely, Bacchides is, is is part of that group too. So so it goes from Jason, and then Jason uh, gets exchanged with Menelaus, and and this seems to be at least that's how the books of Maccabees presented. That this seems to be really some of the things that gets the gets some groups in Judea really broiling against this is not how it should be and of having maybe too much influence and there's clearly many different groups and many different directions of people who think how the Judean priesthood should be run uh, and especially after these exchanges of the high priesthood that's when when uh, 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 these groups seem to become noisier and less content okay so we have a um a tension here between kind of secular and r religious control and powerful political people within the community at large kind of wanting their own say as to how this should go um so it seems like the you know this high priest this is an important role do we have a sense of what is the role what what does a high priest do Absolutely. So uh, we don't have a hundred percent knowledge of what the high priest role, let's say, in one seventy five BCE was, but Judeans thought for a very, very long period of time what the role of the high priest in the history of the high priesthood was. Right. So on the holiest of holies, that is on Yom Kippur, uh, 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 on Yom Kippur, the high priest is the only individual who can go into the holiest of holy and perform uh, a sacrifice to the divine. Um, the high priest also has to live in certain, uh, has to live certain purity, purity laws that, mm -hmm. that, that his family have to adhere to that, that other members of the family don't have to adhere to. And it's a, it's a, it's, it's the immediate relationship between the divine and the temple state of Jerusalem. So the high priest is living, um, a life in such a way that enables them to have better communication with with the divine yes absolutely and and they are uh, uh one of the leading voices in the in the council in the sanhedrin um there are other individuals you mentioned the individual bacchides earlier for example that's a Seleucid general who who governor who is in the area right but mm -hmm. there's an external individual uh, but we also seem to think that from the second century onwards that the council itself can also have positions who sits on this council who are these families right and they seem to have positions that don't necessarily align with that of the high priest but the high priest has a very important uh, and often the senior voice within the, the that that council okay which is the only political articulation of uh, of the city of jerusalem obviously an extremely critical political voice and and underneath the high priest there are other priests um who who from my limited reading seem to do and fulfill many different roles it seems from from my reading they lead armies um they seem to mediate legal disputes they oversee construction projects you know this is what i what i've been reading reading from uh, josephus's books um, but is this accurate? Is there? Can you talk a bit about the duties of of maybe an everyday priest that other people the, in the the population would interact with? Absolutely. So the priestly family is their relationship should be, and it's about legal. You're absolutely right. It's about legal things. It's about it's about building projects. Um, the whole going to war thing that's a bit of a problem. It's it becomes active uh, an active problem in this Maccabean period in this wartime period because there are purity laws uh, uh, associated with the high priest and the priestly families where, you know, um, some priestly families, they shouldn't see blood. They okay. shouldn't. And that is one of that. Also, there are other Judean groups. You know, we just talked about the Maccabees and how they how them and other groups were not happy with with the administration in the 170s. But it also appears to be clear that that there were many Judean groups that were very not happy with the high priest going to war, for example, and riding on horses and experiencing, you know, and like harming individuals and possibly uh, uh, experiencing blood. Um, so, so there's lots of different, in a way, in a way, like theological discussions about about which 
what can a high priest, what can a high priest do and what can he not do? Now, we don't have a significant discussion of evidence from this time period. We know that the uh, rabbinic sources later discuss this at length. And, uh, and that's, of course, a significant time period later, three, four, five hundred years later. Um, and, and it becomes, continues to be a discussion in the Middle Ages. Um, but the, the role of the high priest is, is very, very central. Okay. So it seems like just the, the, the act of a priest being even tangentially involved in an army or violence that itself would be cause for religious discontent amongst portions of the population. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, some some groups would think that that causes impurity. And to other groups, it seems to be acceptable in times of war. And to other groups, that is this impurity, that's, that's an impurity that has occurred called miasma in Greek. And that is a problem. And you cannot have that. So, and that's, in this time period, Judaism is still very, very much in fluid. And so the question is, we can't really say what is the one position on this because there's many, many varying positions, right? And, and this is what's being negotiated at this time period. And it gets challenged every time new, um, well, in a way, every, every time new circumstances arise that, that cause problems for some groups. Mm -hmm. And again, we're, we're kind of the evolution into our, our next question here, we, we've kind of talking about a, a culture under dynamic and extreme pressure changes here and influences. And you mentioned kind of this influence of Greek culture and elements of, of their life. Do we have other or, or maybe a few more examples of how the Seleucids influence Judean culture? Um, that's a very good question. I mean, I mean, in one way, a deep influence of Ju of of Seleucid culture on the Judaism that comes out of the second century is this strong resistance to the Seleucids, is this definition of a Maccabean Hasmonean type of Judaism that wasn't fully articulated until that time period. Um, that doesn't say that uh, there's very strong Seleucid presences, but it's 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 rather the opposite. It's 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 a type of Judaism that gets articulated and becomes dominant almost as part of a response to imperial pressure. So this might be trying to draw some context for the audience here. This would be potentially similar to the way that uh, Athenians might define themselves as not Spartan. Yeah, absolutely. In, in a way, I mean, the in many communities in the Eastern Mediterranean, for example, the the ancient city-state of Babylon, mm -hmm. the priests continue to have their council, and they interact with the with the Seleucid overlords they, as they interacted with previous kings and empires beforehand. But we don't have any evidence of that priestly class to have a strong visceral response to the Seleucids. It almost has no impact; it leaves very little trace. Yeah. In Judea, again, we could say almost that there is relatively little trace. It seems to be striking that that uh, for a certain time in the early second century, I mentioned earlier the period of the 170s, that there seems to be a period in which Greek adaptation of Greek influence seems to become quite popular. Is it because it's pushed very hard or is it just becoming popular? But that from the period from the 160s onwards, that really it seems to be a refocus and a redefinition of what Judaism is and how it's not what's on the outside. It seems to be also a period of a community that's kind of turning inwards mm -hmm. uh, rather than becoming this international community. Uh, I mentioned the city of Maresha and Idumea in the south, right? Yeah. Uh, Maresha and Idumea clearly adopts mountains of elements from Phoenicia, from Egypt, from the Greek world, from Judea. Um, the Judeans do that too. It seems that they are adopting the, the ritual baths, for example, from the South. But, but it seems to be a period of, of really focusing inward. And that is something that is very rare. 
Um, but you could also argue that perhaps without the imperial environment, that that you know the directions could have been quite different. And, and is there any examples of, of kind of the reverse of this happening? Does Judean culture impact uh, the Seleucids in any significant way? The Seleucids are so hard to grasp for us. Um, it's it's so hard to say what is actually Seleucid, right? So so in a way that is that is that is very difficult. I mean, one thing, just to go back to your previous question, one thing that seems to persist in some forms of Judaism is the Seleucid era. Um, my colleague Paul Cosman has written this wonderful book on the Seleucid era, and he he, I mean, something that was well known beforehand, but really that the counting of the Greek years is something that it continues to exist in rabbinic scholarship, right? Those Greek years that are always referred to is always the Seleucid era. Uh, like, going back to your question, I'm sorry yeah. for 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 uh, uh, taking us hostage here and going back. Yeah. It, it, it's very hard to say. I mean, Judea continues to be deeply ingrained, even though it's turning itself on the inside a little bit. The Maccabees are conquering regions and are taking conquering other regions and expanding their territory. Uh, they're also uh, enslaving uh, uh, large groups of populations in the region. And presumably those get uh, sold off to via Seleucid slave markets. This doesn't impact the Seleucid empire as a structural thing, but there must be continuous exchange, right? Okay. Also, the uh, uh, one thing the Maccabees do, especially in the time once they articulate their sort of independence, even though I don't like to call it that because it's difficult to articulate whether it actually means, but they also continue to serve as mercenaries for the Seleucids. So when Antiochus VII in the late one, uh, in the early 120s, takes a campaign against uh, uh, the Parthians and wants to reconquer Babylonia, uh, he calls on his then, you know, um, not ally, but also not vassal, uh, a, a Judean leader, and they follow him uh, into the campaign. Then the uh, uh, Josephus, as you know, Josephus talks to us about very keen how John Hyrcanus came back home as yeah. soon as the king was dead. But the fact that he went with him anyway still tells us that the, that they're still part of the mercenary forces of the Seleucid Empire, that despite this emphasis on separation and difference, that they're still very much uh, overlapping in many areas. That's fascinating to me, um, you know, having going through uh, my background leading up through kind of the history of Greek and Persian relations, you're always kind of at least coming at it from the outside in and looking at it from popular culture. It's always pictured as, um, you know, one side good, one side bad, never the twain shall meet. And yet, as I was doing research, I'm finding documentation of Persians and Greeks working together, not necessarily um, because they were being ruled by, but, you know, l let's get together and let's jointly attack this Greek colony and, and that sort of thing. So it seems like that there's this similar thing happening that even though the history is written by the victors says Seleucid's bad, us good, that there is this happening in the background that suggests that it's not necessarily so black and white. No, I think that's that's absolutely right. I mean, one of the funnest thing of teaching Greek history is when you show students who are taking a class on, let's say, the Persian Wars, right? That you show them all the Greek cities that were fighting on the side of the Persians, right? That yeah. that's that's one of those one of those. The, the students are like, oh, I see. And I think you absolutely have it spot on there when you when it when it's about it's it's the reality in most regions in most instances is always very gray and it's very very complicated. That makes it initially less fun because it's more difficult but it's ultimately also more fun because it becomes so much more complex right yeah well and it, and it i think mirrors the reality of i think political life especially you know who's an enemy now can be my friend tomorrow especially if you're looking for money to build building projects and this person's willing to pay for some mercenaries um i, I think it reflects more on the reality that you know, even back then, people made political decisions that necessarily they they didn't like, but it helped them advance their goals for their overall kind of rulership or whatever nation that they're working for. Yeah, I think I think I think that's right. And that's very, very fair. I mean, one thing one should qualify is the Hasmoneans that are expanding their their 
kingdom, whatever we want to call it, in the first century, in the late second and first century, there is also something that's different about it. And that really is when we look at the material culture, there seems to be this, this inward turning and this kind of no longer adopting, no longer continuing to use the same uh, material culture that was used before, kind of going back to to some other things. So there is a certain conservatism in there that makes this that makes it a little bit different and, and interesting. But that doesn't mean that at the same time people still serve as mercenaries, as we discussed. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, and again, I, you know, we've been kind of dancing around this for you know the the last forty five fifty minutes or so. We've been discussing kind of the the Maccabean revolt and their relationship between themselves and the Seleucids, what, what triggers the revolt? Is, is there a, a, an event or is this several events? What, what happens that starts this uh, independence revolt for Jerusalem? I think the, the Maccabean revolt is fascinating because it's on the one hand straightforward and again, not right. And so on the one hand, I think we already talked about very briefly that there are these, these movements of, presumably elite Judeans who feel in the 170s that, you know, siding with our new overlords, adapting Greek cultural elements, importing some of that nice wine uh, is a nice thing. And there seemed to be a clear movement towards that. And I think there is already some sort of resistance to that. But it's some scholars have argued that it's a resistance between the city, who is very Greek leaning, and the countryside, which is very conservative. I don't think we have any evidence for that. I think that makes that makes no very little sense actually. But it clearly is there is the le Judean leadership in the 170s seems to be thinking that this is the way the journey is going. And then there are clearly those who don't. The the Maccabees, in their story, they are coming out as these you know priestly family from the countryside, and they're clearly not. Um, this priestly family from the countryside, but this is the origin story that is ascribed to them in the book of the Maccabees. So they're clearly, there are some groups like the Maccabees and surely other groups that are not happy with these directions. I would argue that in the 170s, the majority of the political elite is going with this Greek cultural adaptation. Um, and and but, just to be, just to quickly interject it and provide some of the context here. So the, the story that we're told it's and correct me if I'm wrong. It's it's a gentleman by the name of Modin Matthias and his sons. They uh, murder the governor Bacchides, who's do you know oppressing the religious, religiously persecuting the the Jewish people, and he goes into the countryside to hide from the army, and this triggers kind of a popular revolt. This is the, the rough story that we're told. Am, am I this correct? Is the rough, this is the rough story that we're told. Now, the question is, it's a chicken and egg question. What comes first, right? Uh, yeah. We know that at some point, it seems to be that Antiochus IV, on his withdrawal from Egypt, from an Egyptian campaign, also comes into Jerusalem and desecrates the sanctuary and the temple. Um, the question is really... Are there these brewing discontent movements? And, and what is the origin of that? Is what, what starts first? Is it first the revolt? Is it first the king who plunders the treasury? Um, uh, and that leads to the revolt. And I think we ultimately, we, we cannot tell. Um, but it's a combination of clearly a very volatile situation. If you want to think about popular culture, you can think about Andor here, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that it's a volatile situation in which some parts of the community feel one way other parts of the community feel clearly feel another way modein are the maccabees from modein or not we don't know that um that's how they're presented right um i would be highly surprised if they're these complete outsiders that's how the book of maccabees wants us to present this but exactly and then it comes to eventually the revolt comes and there's several groups they're the so-called hasidim they're the, the 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 maccabees and and clearly others and that begins is the beginning of the revolt. The revolt takes its center of the desecration of the sanctuary, right? And that allegedly uh, the Seleucid king sacrificed pork on the altar, destroyed the altar. And, and then we're told by Josephus that the people in Jamaria, Samaria actually rededicated this, the, 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 the sanctuary to Zeus. Um, Ooh, <laughs> that's a bad, that happen, bad move. Did that not happen is, yeah. is a difficult situation to describe. Mm -hmm. 
clearly the sanctuary was forbidden to perform sacrifices and clearly that enraged large parts of the Judean population. And that led to the revolt. The, the end of the revolt uh, uh, is celebrated at 164 when, when the sanctuary is rededicated, right? Our, uh, not our, but the, the modern day Jewish celebration of Hanukkah is this celebration of life, right? The rededication of the temple after the Seleucid sack. Uh, it's not a major Jewish holiday, but it's a, it's, it's a holiday we celebrate every year, right? Yeah. Um, and with that, the sanctuary is rededicated. Now, in 160, after famous battle, allegedly the revolt is over, but it is also important, we already mentioned that very briefly, that, that the Maccabees are not yet in charge. They're clearly one of the strongest, if not the strongest, power holder in the region, but they're not yet, they're not yet high priests. They're not yet in charge. The high priest and the group around the high priest, um, I think Book of Maccabees and Josephus describe it as those that had hidden themselves in the Acre, in the fortress. Mm -hmm. um, there's a fortress in Jerusalem somewhere. And within that fortress, there are those who have hidden themselves in the fortress. But it also tells us that the Maccabees, yes, they're telling us they're in charge and they rededicated the sanctuary, but they're not yet at the center of the political power. And from 160 to 153, so for at least seven years, 64 to 63, right? Seven, 10 years, that group that the Maccabees like to talk about as this, this, this one small group, they're still the one who are technically in charge of the city. Uh, they're still in charge of the relationship with the Seleucid state. Um, and it's only in 153, which we talked about very briefly, when Jonathan gets granted the high priesthood, that the Judeans actually, uh, that the Maccabees get officially being put in the center of the Judean state. Um, yeah, sorry, that you asked me about the triggers and now we ran through it all. <laughs> oh no, that this is fantastic. I, you know, it's clear you you love and enjoy what you're talking about. So it's it's fantastic just to hear somebody who enjoys it talking about it because I, I'm getting excited about it as you're talking about it. A, as we've kind of gone through this, so in the aftermath of the revolts, you know, you mentioned it, it's still up in the air. It's not necessarily written in stone who's in charge, but it seems from what I've been reading in, in the, you know, Wars of the Jews by Josephus, that even internally within the family of the Maccabeans, that there is kind of um, ambition for who is going to be in charge. It, it just seems that there's cutthroat <laughs> cutthroat wars for who's going to be king or high priest in in charge there is this accurate absolutely it it's it's clearly even after the maccabees are in charge and especially after jonathan and after the death of simon uh the maccabee um the position continues to be unstable right the 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 maccabees manage to install a system of kind of Hellenistic kingship. I think we talked about that very briefly earlier, but their authority is still questioned, especially also from within the family. And then there are other groups whom we had not talked about as much. And we talked about the community at Qumran, who clearly at this time period, now 130s, 140s, who decide we're done. We're no longer part of this group. This is not right. We want to be away. It is, it is also this time period when the Maccabees are, are starting to fight uh, wars against its closest neighbors. Uh, Samaria gets overrun and conquered. Idumea, we talked about the city of Moresha, gets overrun and conquered and destroyed in 112. Uh, and these people, we are told, get forcibly conversed into Judaism. It's a very volatile, continues to be a volatile period. It continues to be highly unstable at the level of the central power. Brothers are murdering brothers. Um, but clearly also underlying many, many of the tensions that we later, uh, those of us who, who want to read the Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Matthew, the stories that we see these different Judean groups in, um, in the time of the Jesus movement are still there, right? I mean, that's a hundred years later. Uh, but it still tells you that even so, I indicate, and I think it's true that this is a time period in which gets solidified what Judaism in the second century and first century becomes, there's still many, many other alternative options. And, and that also has political consequences. 
Yeah, you, you you've mentioned some of these these groups before, and it's interesting because you you talked about King Simon, who after he he dies, I think it's his brother or his son who's a King Alexander, That's who right. who it, itself himself is dealing with internal revolt, and and you know you read an account in Josephus, he crucifies eight eight hundred people and then murders their wives and children in front of them while they're dying on the cross to just terrify the population. But his, after Alexander dies, his wife, Alexandria, is written about in very loving terms by Josephus. And he refers to her, I think, as a Sadducee. Yes, yes, absolutely. And so this is a very interesting thing that you point out. I mean, the, the fact that Alexandra Salome uh, can become king after Alexander Yanias and John Hyrcanus before him, um, is sign of that this is, even though we are learning here what is a new type of Judea and a new type of Judaism, is that this is a Hellenistic monarchy in a different way than the other Hellenistic monarchies. But clearly the fact that queens can become king, she doesn't seem to act if we want to talk about it in a, in a gendered manner. She doesn't seem to be it doesn't seem to be queenship. It seems to be that she's acting in kingship, right? She's yeah. just performing the, what what the king would do, and but that that in itself is possible. That that it seems to me is a clear element, especially in Judean society, of the of the strong Hellenistic influences. It's almost like a like a paradox, right? That this turning towards a certain type of Judaism is only possible by adopting Hellenistic kingship as its form of government. But you spoke about the Sadducees, and this is a very, very interesting thing. Um, Josephus, as you, as you and I spoke about earlier, right, um, creates these groups, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, and the Zealots. And in a way, they're very, very complicated because Josephus is kind of the only one who talks with us about them. Um, interesting. Okay. Josephus also introduces them to us almost like philosophical schools and clearly wants to talk about us about stoics or or platonists in a way that the greek world and the roman world are used to philosophical schools but clearly it's also not how it works so uh, i have to admit i'm totally agnostic about these groups and what we can actually do with them um it seems to be that some of them are you know the 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 gentry the nobility of jerusalem it seems to be that uh, uh and certainly the pharisees they're the ones we actually know from the jesus movement right where, yeah. where uh, uh they they do pop up in later literatures but what they are and what they're standing for beyond i mean there's very learned scholar named Albert Baumgarten. He has written a very long book about them. But but to me, to me, I have to admit, what we can sense from actually knowing about these different groups is very, very difficult to say. And it's it's to me, it really is, it underlines the many, many different streams of of thought and Judaism and Judaistic uh, uh, tendencies. Um, but they're not like it's not that there's strong political parties or that they're religious systems that you just, you know, that that's what you get born into. It seems to be that some behavior in terms of like, can the high priest go to war that makes you for Josephus, that puts you in a category of this for <laughs> whether these people themselves would have thought themselves to be in these categories. To me, I I'm completely, I, I mean, this is not my center of speciality, but in terms of the time I've spent thinking about this, it, it's completely agnostic. I think it's largely an external category. It's useful because it shows us that there are these many different groups. And I think that really is the, um, it's, it's emblematic of Judea at this time period, that really there is not one stream of thoughts, but that's as far as I would probably go with it. So it, would it be accurate or, or would it be uh, anachronistic to try and um, compare this to Roman Catholicism, Protestantism, and, you know, Calvinists, or, you know, uh, do we, is, is there a sense that we all believe the same thing, but we believe different elements of the same thing? And because you don't believe this one thing, then therefore your entire faith is wrong? Or is there a sense that it's much more 
of, yeah, we have some different thinkings about what it means to be Jewish, but in the end, we, we all get along and it's just, this is what you believe and I believe. I think, I, to be honest, I don't think it's wrong to make these, they are anachronistic, but I don't think it's wrong to make these, uh, these, these, these comparisons because they sometimes can be very useful. So I don't think it's like, let's say, if I am baptized Protestant and you're baptized Catholic, I don't think, let's say that happens today, right? Yeah. I don't think that's how it was because I don't think there are these clear ritual and cultic differentiations that articulate what you are, right? Because if I if I'm baptized Catholic and uh, Protestant and you're baptized Catholic, we can go to a priest or a vicar and he can explain to us very clearly why that's different. Yeah. Right. And I I, I don't think that's how it was. So that's not what it is. But I also, I think you're absolutely right in outlining that we still have something that we believe in together. I mean, there seem to be some groups. We've I've mentioned the community at Qumran many times before, right? This group yeah. that decides to go away. For a very long time by a very famous uh, German scholar whose name I now just escapes my mind, this has been essentialized to say these must be the Essenes. This community at Qumran must be the Essenes. People who are rejecting the political government, they're, they're going into the desert. Uh, I don't think we still think these are the Essenes, which is, in, in fact, it's, it's far more interesting because now that means we have at least two of these groups, right? Yeah. Who, who are rejecting the central authority. Um, I think what this means is, is I think a lot of it depends on your social status and about your political uh, political class and about your political action at the time um, that you may have, because of your class and your upbringing and uh, you, your family, you may have certain leanings in terms of the type of Judaism. Yeah. But I also think that over time you could change it. So I don't think that that you know that if you're you you have to be always a Sadducee. I think that's that's these are not the the directions. And clearly there are some extremist groups, the the zealots, right? They are these extremist groups who 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 perform violence, terroristic acts, right? In the in the Roman period, yeah. um, they are different groups. Okay. But at the same, sorry, I, 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 I don't want to ramble. But they're different groups. But I don't think that they that the people would have identified themselves as these groups. Yes, some of them are radicals and some of them are the ones who work with the political center. But uh, you can, depending on your age, on your class, you might see this differently. Okay. So this isn't a um, um, Christian versus Protestant group. This is very much a Judaism religion that's dynamic and in flux and not quite set in stone and these are gr groups of people trying to figure it out absolutely very very fluid and 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 these groups i mean judifus talks to us about these groups but but we see from really the early period and and one of the most fascinating things about judaism in the fourth century is that, that we have these couple of letters in egypt about a jewish temple in 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 egypt and they want to talk to um they want to get a letter from Jerusalem to confirm something about a Jewish uh, a, a, a garrison and, and they don't get a response. And some scholars said, well, it's probably because the people in Jerusalem don't want this other temple to exist anymore. But even Josephus talks to us about the fact that there are still uh, is still a family in the third century that creates a second temple in Egypt. In this time period, apparently the majority of Judeans seems to agree that there should only be one temple. Yeah, it's a not in Samaria, uh, not in Egypt, but only in Jerusalem. And according to Josephus, it's an almost exact replica of, That's of right. the temple. Exactly, exactly, exactly. But at this time period, it seems to be that it should only be one oh, yeah. for the majority, right? Yeah. How, what that means for all of us and what we believe in, that seems to be completely unclear. Okay. This has been an extremely fascinating discussion. Is there anything you you feel we we could have or maybe should have talked about that we we haven't touched on <laughs> there's mountains right that, um, <laughs> you, um, you teach a whole course on this so that there's um, yeah many um, <laughs> there's no, hours I, and hours I, yeah. I, I really enjoyed the conversation i mean i think one of the things i've learning more and more and more is 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 also with my with my work in in idumea and maresha is that it's such a complex region it's such a small space Right within the proximity of a hundred kilometers, you have a different 
a different uh, zone, a different, completely different layer of geo geomorphology, a different, diff different irrigation, a different watershed. And, uh, 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 and we have so many layers of the cultural history of this region that's still there to be discovered. And, and on top of that is, is, is that we, you know, that is, as you were describing at the outset, is this, it's this region that's at the nexus of different empires trying to inter interact with one another. Uh, I, I, I really enjoy talking to you. I could talk about this for hours, but uh, maybe we should do that another time. <laughs> I'd love to have you back on the show sometime. Perfect. Great. No, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Boris, for taking time out of your busy schedule. And uh, this has been an extremely fascinating and entertaining conversation. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.